Welcome to our program, Bertelsmann and the Future of Publishing. I'm Christopher Keneally, host of CCC's podcast series, Velocity of Content. In November 2020, Penguin Random House announced plans to purchase rival Simon & Schuster from Viacom CBS for more than $2 billion. Penguin Random House, the largest book publisher in the United States, is owned by the German media conglomerate Bertelsmann, a private family-owned multinational corporation that is one of the world's largest media conglomerates and which includes the BMG music label. Combining with Simon & Schuster, the US's third largest publisher would create a fearsome book behemoth as the New York Times noted at the time. The PRH SNS merger immediately raised the possibility that the US Department of Justice would seek to block it on antitrust grounds. The Biden administration, which took office in January, 2021, made clear its ambitions to step up its antitrust enforcement. The president appointed Lena Kahn to lead the Federal Trade Commission and Timothy Wu as a special White House advisor responsible for technology and competition policy. Both are vocal proponents of using government powers to ensure marketplace competition, especially in cases of market consolidation. On November 2nd, 2021, the Department of Justice filed a complaint in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to block Penguin Random House's proposed acquisition of Simon & Schuster. If the world's largest book publisher is permitted to acquire one of its biggest rivals, it will have unprecedented control over this important industry, said U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland. American authors and consumers will pay the price of this anti-competitive merger. Lower advances for authors, and ultimately fewer books and less variety for consumers, he warned. Attorneys for PRH and SNS responded that the government just does not understand how publishing works. The government wants to block the merger under the misguided theory that it will diminish comp compensation to the, just the highest paid authors, a PRH lawyer told the New York Times. That is legally, economically, and factually wrong, and it ignores the vast majority of authors who will indisputably benefit from the transaction. Our panel today will consider the pending Bertelsmann Random House acquisition of Simon & Schuster, the, anti -case brought, uh, the antitrust case brought to stop it, and the ongoing concerns over industry consolidation. As one by one publishers disappear, taking the top level of houses from a big six before the Penguin and Random House merger in 2013 to possibly only four in 2022, is it possible or even inevitable that the competition in trade book publishing is on its way to becoming extinct. Joining us today as uh, a panel, uh, first uh, speaker is Mary Rosenberger. She's the CEO of the Authors Guild and the Authors Guild Foundation. Mary, welcome to the program. Hi, Chris, thank you. It's nice to be with everyone today. Very happy you can join us, Mary. Also with us today is Christopher Sagers. He's the James Thomas Professor of Law at Cleveland State University, and he specializes in antitrust law. Welcome, Professor Sagers. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be here. And our final panelist is Andrew Albany, senior writer at Publishers Weekly. He's the author of The Battle of 999, How Apple, Amazon, and Big Six Publishers Changed the E-Book Business Overnight. He's also a colleague of mine, joins me every Friday on Velocity of Content. Good to see you, Andrew. Hey there, Chris. It's great to be here with, with Mary and Professor Sagers. Well, we want to open the program, as I said, with Mary Rosenberger, the CEO of the Office Guild. And, and Mary, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I, I tried to tee up the, the, the facts in the situation right now, but there's a lot of history, a lot of context around industry consolidation in publishing. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, I think it's important to understand this merger in, in the context of, of the mergers that have come before it, you know, it's the culmination of six decades of prior mergers with many prior publishers, now divisions or imprints of Penguin Random House or Simon & Schuster or one of the other big five. And that this merger is sort of the last straw. So the move toward consolidation started in the 1960s, as early as 1970, Business Week wrote of an epidemic of publishing mergers. It said, with the big fish swallowing the little fish, this, the book business is becoming increasingly competitive and brutal. It is evolving into an industry of giants and dwarfs with mid-sized companies of vanishing species. 
Um, and then in 1978, the Authors Guild actually testified in front of the Senate on this epidemic of, of publishing mergers. Um, and John Brooks, then president, said, previously in the man you dealt with, the publisher himself or his editor was what I would call a bookman. He had mixed motives. He needed to make money, but he was balancing that motive with literary, artistic, and social values. He had a sincere interest in the literary va value as well as the potential for profit. And then he goes on to say, what's happened now is that one finds oneself faced with what's called an acquisition editor. He or his department are a profit center competing with other profit centers within a large firm of which they are part. And this is sort of the growing <laughs> um, biz pr profit um, uh, concentration of, um, of publishing industry that we'll talk a little bit about more about today. You know, this is, we are hearing the same, the same issues today with respect to this potential merger. Um, and, you know, and given that, so when that, when the Authors Guild said that in 1978, the five largest publishers accounted for less than one third of all trade book sales. And the four largest book publishing chains accounted for less than 12% of combined trade book sales. So a very, very different kind of marketplace where today we've got one major internet retailer and um, only one, one chain left, barely left. Um, so in the 80s, the, the Authors Guild continued to talk about, um, about mergers and the issues. And this was at a time when Harper and Rowe um, was about to be taken over. The Guild president, the late Robert Massey wrote in the Times that almost every time a takeover happens, the company that's acquired disappears or its list is cut way back, further diminishing the opportunities available to authors to have their work published. So, I won't go into all the various mergers and acquisitions, but this trend continued throughout the 90s um, in, um, uh, in between 2009, 2013, there was an average of a dozen transactions per year in the um, M&A world in publishing. And then in 2013, Random House acquired Penguin to create PRH um, and um, and there were more mergers between 2014 and 2019, um, not just by the big five, but also consolidation among mid-sized publishers. And then last year, as you know, we saw two other blockbuster deals, HarperCollins, Bart Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, one of the few non-big five remaining um, mid-sized publishers. And Hachette then uh, uh, purchased Workmen in September 19, uh, 2021. So the merger between SNS and PRH, which PRH is already, just to put the, this into perspective after all these other acquisitions, it's already twice as large as the next big publisher, which is HarperCollins. I'm talking about in the United States. The merger would create a company that would collectively control more than two thirds of the trade book market. Um, particularly the advanced paying book market. And it would have twice the revenue in the United States as the next three largest publishers, that is HarperCollins, Hachette, and Macmillan. And there is some fear that the merger would force the other three to consolidate further, potentially leaving us with two or maybe three publishers. Um, I also want to note that the, um, that the combined company would control 70% 70, 70 of the market for literary and general fiction and 60% of the market for trade biography. So it, it would have an out, even more outsized place in, in the economy. Absolutely, and, and Mary Rosenberger with the, the Authors Guild, uh, the concern you have of course is the impact on authors and their careers. You did not bring this case, it's a Department of Justice uh, case, an antitrust case, but as I understand it, the Authors Guild really uh, uh, strongly urged something to be done and um, you do so because you're concerned that the merger, uh, the acquisition of Simon Schuster by PRH would, would, would have a real significant impact on authors and their careers, let alone on the marketplace and the readers and so forth. So tell us about the impact on authors. 
uh, especially those those authors that uh, are in, in the market cases where there are advances of pay. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, so we did um, write a letter to DOJ uh, when the proposed merger was announced. Um, I should also say we've been talking to DOJ and FTC for years about problems with monopsonies in the industry. Um, so quite simply, this merger would leave authors with even fewer purchases, purchasers of their manuscripts, and so less leverage, um, which means ultimately lower advances um, and also worse contract terms. You know, and that is actually one of the, the concerns we had aside from um, author advances, which the DOJ complaint talks about very um, compellingly, is that we, the Authors Guild, would have less um, leverage to go to PRH or go to any publisher and say, you've got to improve your terms, other terms in their, con their standard contracts, um, and point to other publishers' better terms. So, um, so the merger would create a monopsony, um, and that's where, so everyone understands, a monopsony is where there's a concentration in the buyers of goods. Um, and I'm sure Chris Sagers will tell us more about that later, um, you know, as opposed to a concentration in the, the, uh, the um, consumer facing seller of goods, which is a monopoly. So, uh, so this kind of monopsony, it, it would harm authors in this advanced paying market for trade books, as I said, simply because it decreases competition for, for manuscripts in that marketplace. Um, the advanced paying market is a very important market for those who live off their writing income. And I don't need to tell most of you in attendance today that. Um, you know, because the advanced paying market is what supports writers um, who write the kind of nonfiction and fiction books that take multiple years to research and write. And these tend to be significant books. They tend to win the most awards, have the great, greatest sales, hence the greatest number of readers and the greatest influence. Um, the kind of advance is paid by the big five and, and a few other uh, publishers, though not as consistently, they provide authors with the necessary time and resources to develop the kinds of books that are capable of transforming the way we see the world, the way we interact with one another. And of course, these are general, generalizations because there are many exceptions. But the, the way it works in the advanced paying market is an agent generally tries to get an auction going. That's where you get the, the greater advance. You try to bid up the advance. Um, often the advance is all you ever get. And a big advance often means it's a big investment by the company. So they're more likely to put more marketing dollars or at least heft behind the book. So I, it's just simply if PRH cars SNS, um, there's one less company to go into a bidding war. And ultimately that will mean authors won't be able to bid up their, the, their advances. The, uh, DOJ's complaint does provide a number of examples of bidding wars between PRH and Prince and SNS where um, the, um, the price did get bid up um, when it was just those two companies left, um, which was interesting. Um, and um, I, I should clarify though that when agents go out to, um, to editors at imprints, they don't go out to the big publishing houses. And sometimes the imprints, even within a big publishing house, say PRH, um, have bids and bid against each other. But most companies have policies that say you can't bid each other up. Now, PRH is an exception. They at least say that they allow, even now, before the merger, they allow imprints to bid against each other up to a certain point, at which point the parent company comes in and says, no, no more. Um, and we, uh, we asked that if the merger did go through that PRH extend this to the S&S imprint. So in other words, they allow S&S imprints to bid against each other and against PRH imprints. And we wanted DOJ to put this in a consent decree because ultimately PRH did finally say, okay, we'll do that, um, which was a big, um, you know, I, I, I think that that was, you know, it took it took a lot for them to get there, but they did. And um, so we went to DRJ and said, can you put this in a consent decree? And they said, no, it's not enforceable. 
Um, and they then went, went ahead and, and filed the lawsuit. Um, but, um, you know, I do think that the DOJ's complaint shows that it, it really understands that authors inevitably lose income when there's limited competition for their work. And that, you know, in turn impacts the reading public because fewer books are, or important books are written simply because at some point authors can't afford to, to write these kind of books. Well, Simon, uh, Simon and Schuster is owned by, by Viacom CBS, uh, which has publicly said it wants to sell Simon and Schuster. It intends to do so. It has it has its own plans for the future of Viacom that do not include that publishing house. So the sale, a sale, I should say, is going to happen one way or the other. Is is there a preference, if you will, for one particular buyer over another, and obviously some of the uh, potential bidders for this could be in private equity. You've already brought up the concern around the focus on profit over uh, literary uh, concerns. Wouldn't that make things worse? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So this isn't simple. I mean, nothing's ever simple, right? And the, um, the response of agents, in fact, was very mixed. And we even had some, between the time the merger was announced and DOJ brought the complaint, we uh, filed the complaint. We did have even a lot of internal discussions among our counsel about this, because here's the fear is that if um, SNS is gonna get sold anyway, and by and large agents like PRH. They like them because they're, they're easier to work with. They're transparent on royalties. They know how to market and sell books. Their contracts are one of the least worst <laughs> from our perspective in the industry. Um, and they prefer PRH to another potential suitor, um, as well as and especially private equity. So there's a real fear about private equity coming into publishing. It's already gone into journalism, the music industry, and private equity really has, you know, one, one interest and that's profit. But as in the quotes I read earlier, publishing's never been a purely rational profit driven market and we don't want it to become one. Um, when people go into publishing, they do because they love books. They wanna see great books published, not to get rich. And more, more and more diverse books get published that way. That was our concern back in 1978. You know, it's still our concern. Um, so yeah, and we're particularly concerned about the SNS midlist authors. What happens if private equity comes in? So it's complicated, but ultimately our council, which is the board of the of the guild decided that we had to come out strongly against the merger because we as an organization um, do not support this further consolidation in the industry. It's only going to hurt authors ultimately. All right, well, we're Mary, Mary Rosenberger, CEO of the Authors Guild, thank you very much for that. We'll come back to you, but I wanna turn now to uh, Professor Christopher Sagers, uh, Cleveland State University. Uh, Professor Sagers, welcome again. Hi, thank you. Uh, so tell us, uh, from your perspective, as someone who watches uh, the antitrust law evolve and has written about that, um, where we stand today, that there, there really is a, uh, some confusion, if I could put it that way, ar around how we should view antitrust law. Mary's already brought mm -hmm. up monopoly and monopsony. There's uh, a, a real, and, and you helped educate me on this, I'm sure you will for the, for the audience too, there's, there isn't a lot of clarity around what the focus is. We, we think it's about competition, but what kind of competition? So tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, uh, very good questions. Uh, jumping right, at, right into the biggest picture. Um, I mean, there, there's so much to say uh, that we can't possibly say uh, all of it uh, in the 10 or 15 minutes that I'm going to speak. Um, I mean, two, two, there are at least two, two issues in your uh, uh, question, I think. One, one being sort of the humdrum question of, uh, you know, how, how should this case be decided or where is this case going or how should, uh, how should uh, authors and others who care about books um, uh, want the case to be decided? Um, and that sort of naturally leads to a much bigger question of, um, 
uh, you know, it is it, competition uh, to, to whatever extent it's good generally. I mean, if you uh, if you're if you're going to have a capitalist state like the one we've got, is it really right for every industry? And in particular, is it right for sort of a sacred special um, domain like like books? Um, I, I mean, that's that's what I find the most interesting kind of questions. I uh, um, I uh, was not really a publishing expert. <clears throat> and probably still am not much of one yet. Um, but I started thinking about publishing a whole lot about 10 years ago um, when uh, the last really big, really uh, visible antitrust case happened in, in publishing, which was the famous ebooks case uh, of about 2012. Uh, I, I have a feeling everybody here will at least dimly remember the case in which uh, these same publishers, these, these big five, at that time they were the big six, uh, got together and sort of tried to uh, circle the wagons against Amazon. Uh, and man, was that an interesting case. Um, and, and again, it's interesting on so many levels, so many more than I could possibly really get into. But um, it was the most interesting on this biggest level, which I, I think you're, you're asking me about, which is, um, it, should we want competition? Should we force... Uh, force publishers to compete with each other, for example, at the, in the wholesale prices or wholesale terms they offer to Amazon, is competition of the, the unbridled capitalism that we sort of imagine that we have in the United States, is that good for books in the same way that it's good for, you know, uh, toilet seats or, or staples? <laughs> um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I mean, I wrote a book about it. I spent, I spent 10 years thinking about it. Uh, I tragically, uh, overlooked monograph, by the way, which is on sale at bookstores near you. Um, but in that book, I mean, my, my big, like, okay, so I came at this as sort of like a, you know, a traditional antitrust generalist who leans modestly left, I guess. And uh, when the Justice Department sued the big publishers, uh, you know, I, I thought it was an easy case. I mean, these folks were uh, uh, caught doing things that in, in other industries routinely send people to prison. I mean, they, they it was a undisguised, very obviously a legal scheme, uh, but people all across, and by the way, whenever I say that in a group like this, I, I have this primitive terror that somebody who was a defendant in that case might be in the audience. Cause that, that actually happened to me once the very first time I talked about this case. Um, uh, I will say one, one of the things I love about uh, talking about these issues though, is that this, this sort of community of, of book people uh, are, have, in my experience, have always been so, uh, so open-minded, I think, to the issues, uh, ma mainly because people obviously care about this business um, so much. But anyway, the, the thing that has always struck me, the thing that's always been most fascinating to me about this whole problem is, is something that Mary said earlier, which is just that it, it really isn't simple. Like, I, I don't know what the answer is. I feel like I have some answers, um, but uh, uh, the problems inherent in them are, are very big, big, big picture problems. I mean, if the question is, um, uh, you know, is, is competition good for books? Uh, there, there's some very big picture problems. Um, yeah. and, and, and Professor Sager, so, so, so antitrust law in, in, in the marketplace of large has really focused on price and efficient markets in that way. Uh, yeah. And it hasn't been about the issues that Mary raised, you know, democracy, social value, richness of ideas, diversity, and all of that. Sure. Antitrust hasn't looked at those concerns. And so what we're asking it to do is to shift its focus, really, aren't we? Uh, I mean, I, I would say no, actually. That, that's, the, that's the going um, discussion, that antitrust has been focused on, you know, very low prices, low consumer retail prices is the only thing we care about. Um, and uh, many, many people now believe that that's a, a bad thing. Uh, that certainly was a theme of popular discussion of the old ebooks case. It's been a theme in every competition case involving uh, publishing uh, for a very long time. Uh, the theme being, uh, well, publishing is is special. This is an intellectual product, uh, et cetera. And therefore, uh, we can't just focus on having low price books for authors or whatever. Um, I, I would say that that discussion gets things a little bit wrong. I think antitrust has actually always cared about uh, all of those uh, uh, you know, broader values, democracy and the uh, variety of content and uh, uh, quality and so on. And it cares about it uh, at least to the extent uh, that markets care about those things. 
And you can be very cynical about that. And many people are, and I suppose I am to some degree. Uh, but I think possibly the best we can do in having a competition policy for books or anything else um, is uh, at least try to use markets for the things that they can do reasonably well. And uh, despite what some people say, I think that markets don't just um, uh, produce very low price products. They do actually reward uh, quality and variety and so on. I mean, if, um, uh, if people want better books, uh, markets will by and large deliver them if markets are working well. Um, and hence, you know, people like me, I guess, and, and some other people think that we do actually need antitrust. Uh, so as an example, um, if you only have four publishing firms, uh, one of which controls, uh, I mean, the numbers here are breathtaking and I, and I, I forget them even part, partly because things have changed so much, but one, one firm is going to control like two thirds of, of trade publishing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at least on some measures. Um, that's really not a market that works at all. Uh, so to the extent that markets uh, can do anything well beyond just uh, uh, generating low consumer prices, um, th this one probably won't do it very well. It will be clumsy and uh, so on. Uh, and I think it will be worse with, with the increased concentration. Well, well, handicap the case as an observer of antitrust law, which is evolving, which is perhaps in the process of swinging in a different direction than it has been for a while. Where do you think this is going to turn out? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, so uh, I, I see this case as about a 50-50 kind of case. The, the government could win. Uh, it's, uh, it's not an especially uphill case as, as antitrust cases go now. Uh, antitrust cases are always hard now because our antitrust law, frankly, uh, is nearly dead. Um, but the government could definitely win this. Um, without getting too much into the weeds, um, you know, merger law as it exists now is almost entirely a question of counting up market shares. Uh, deals are essentially never illegal unless they are, as we say, horizontal mergers. And this happens to be a horizontal merger. In other words, it is two firms that horizontally compete. They sell the same products to the same consumers, uh, combining their forces. So, you know, that's step one in merger law. It's horizontal. It can be illegal. Um, and then the question is just, well, uh, how big will the, the resulting firm's market share be? Uh, and how, how much will the increase in its market share, uh, uh, you know, how much will it increase as a result of the merger? Uh, there had been a very informal rule of thumb in Washington for a long time, which is that uh, the Justice Department won't stop a merger unless it represents, as we say, a four to three. Uh, you know, a merger in which there had been four major firms in a market, uh, which will be reduced to three. Uh, and many people say, notably, uh, these merging entities and their, their very fancy lawyer like to say, well, this is a 5-4. But this, this is actually a very unusual 5-4 in which the acquiring firm is already so big. It's already so much larger than the remainder uh, that even the remaining four firms will leave very, very little uh, competition on the, you know, as we traditionally understand competition. So, 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 so if it's a 50-50 case, Professor Sagers, and it goes either way, one way yeah. or another, are consumers, are readers going to notice any difference? Yeah, yeah. good question. I, I mean, and, you know, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think consumers are going to notice much difference. Uh, book prices will not change appreciably. I, I would take a guess as a result of this merger. Consu consumer retail injury isn't really where it's at. Um, I don't know if, if authors will in the way that um, the Justice Department says. I think that authors will probably still be fairly frustrated with publishers, as they always have been, and they probably won't notice a huge difference in their experience. Um, agents will tell different stories after this happens over the next five years. Uh, here's my deal. I think um, uh, the problem in having a competition policy is that you can't let it get to the state that ours has gotten to. I mean, if you're only enforcing antitrust law, when you get down to three firm markets or four firm markets like this one's going to be where one of the firms is really dominant, um, you've already exhausted all the competition that could ever have done us any good. Um, you know, consumer prices aren't going to go up because they're already the highest a monopolist could charge, I think. Um, if there were only one firm in the market, consumer prices might go up a little bit, but I bet they wouldn't. Um, yeah. Well, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, I will 
use the word guardedly, but it's a depressing prospect. It sounds like Professor Chris Sagers with the Cleveland State University. Thank you so much. And, and we'll get back to you as well. And if there are questions from the audience, uh, please use the chat. And let us know if there's if it's for a particular individual on the panel. And, and I want to turn now for some commentary and editorial analysis uh, with uh, my colleague for the Velocity Content Podcast every Friday, Andrew Albanese, PW's senior writer. Andrew, good to see you. Hey, Chris. And so you follow the case, but you also follow the publishing world. And in these publishing times, tell us about what you see, what you hear about how concerned authors and others are in the book world about the problem of consolidation. Yeah, sure. So first of all, that was excellent background from Mary and Chris. So certainly uh, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think authors, obviously, I, I can answer this fairly easily. Authors are very concerned about consolidation. I think all of us are very concerned about consolidation in the industry. At the same time, I feel like maybe given the last two years and things that are going on in the publishing business, it tends to get sort of pushed to the background, right? It's, it's an interesting time for the trade publishing market, because in terms of sales, it has been the most remarkable two years of sales I've seen in my entire career. And that's either as a publisher or as a reporter for the last 24 years. And I think we're all expecting sales to cool off a bit this year, but I still believe they're going to settle in at a level that's well above pre-pandemic levels and, you know, well above where they would have been had this historic event not happened. You know, publishing is a mature business, right? You know, if you're able to get one to 3% growth a year, well, that takes some work, uh, you know, but the industry has managed to stuff about, you know, a decade's worth of gains into the last two years of sales. And, you know, that's really taken some heat. That's really, you know, been a, a positive focus for people and taking some heat off of some of the consolidation issues, right? It's obviously this market is working pretty well if we're growing that fast. You know, I think we all have our theories too as to about why sales are growing, but I think it's going to take some time to really understand this historic sales spike, right? As, as we get further from the disruptions and the responses that came in the wake of the pandemic, I think we'll have a clearer picture of why sales have grown so much. But you know, some of the trends that are worth exploring, you know, backlist sales, for example, are are booming, right? That they're, you know, some publishers report that they're about seventy percent of sales now. You know, we had this Trump effect that started during the Trump presidency, where nonfiction sales really jumped. And you, know, you wonder if that's gonna to start to tail off as the, the last crop of memoirs and tell-all starts to come onto the market. And I think you have to keep an eye on the economy now too, because during the pandemic, people had more time, they had a little more disposable income in the form of stimulus checks, and they had to spend less money on things like travel to go to work or you know, vacations. And any publisher will tell you that the economy is probably the number one factor that impacts them in any year. Uh, and this year, it's more expensive and more labor intensive to get books to market because of supply chain disruptions and paper shortages. And consumers are now dealing with massive inflation and high gas prices. And there's talk of a recession. So we haven't even gotten into the issue of Amazon yet, which I'm sure we will at some point. So, you know, how concerned are authors about consolidation? Extremely concerned. But there's a lot of other stuff on their minds, too. Uh, but I think, as Mary can attest, you know, the concern with consolidation has been there for decades. She spoke about it. Now, are authors appreciably more concerned about the Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster merger? For me, I think it's hard to say, you know, because it's been code red for authors for so long, right? The impact of consolidation, as Chris just alluded to, has been hitting author advances for almost as long as I've been in the business. Since my first day as an editorial assistant in 1989, uh, at Penguin, where we were being put together with Viking under one roof and the acquisition of Putnam was still to come. Back when I was a 22-year-old editorial assistant, there were dozens of houses you could shop your manuscript to. You know, and now we have five, about to be four. And you know, those independent bidders, they could once go to their independent owners and, and say why they needed more money for an author. Well, those are now imprints in, in, in a corporate structure. So now, now the good news is too, we have entered a golden age for indie publishing, right? There are so many absolutely phenomenal small presses out there that can really do a wonderful job getting books to market. So actually getting published is not so much a challenge. You can find someplace that will print and shop your book. But the advanced thing, the advanced question is really where it's at because these small presses just can't pay competitive advances. And Look, I may be speaking to the choir here a little bit at this conference, but when people hear about someone getting a $100,000 advance, it sounds like a lot of money. It's not. You know, especially if you, you live in New York or San Francisco, writing a book 
is hard work. It's a full-time job, especially the kind of work that, the kind of work that this audience today produces, right? Um, you know, and you when you get that hundred thousand dollar advance, maybe you get a quarter of it on signing. You get another quarter of it when you deliver the manuscript, however long that takes, and acceptance. Uh, maybe the rest of it is dribbled out a year later on publication or a little later, if you're published on time. Well, that's just not livable. You know, if you break up $100,000, which sounds like a lot of money over 18 months or two years, and the amount of work you actually have to put in, it's just not hard. It's hard. It's just not livable. Well, you know, it's, it's one thing that's hard, too, is talking about publishing in a group here that includes people in publishing. So really, we, we, we should point out that we have uh, as assembled as, as, as uh, diverse a panel as we could find. Uh, editors and people in publishing were also invited to join us. They declined to do so. Obviously, there were concerns about talking about com com you know, competitors in certain ways. But, but I do have to ask you about reputation of uh, Penguin Random House. So, so uh, those two came together, as we have said, in, in 2013. What kind of a publisher has PRH turned out to be? What kind of a mega house are they? Do you have any certain reputation, perhaps even for unfairly exerting their power over the market? I suppose I should be careful how I answer this question. I'll, I'll point back to Mary, who made some observations about Penguin Random House. So, you know, the, the merger of, of Random House and Penguin a decade ago, I, I think it was, you know, that was a response to market conditions, right? Our reporting at PW always suggested that this was, you know, really about concerns over the future at the time, right? Print books were in a precarious position. Ebooks were on the rise. Amazon was accruing this dominant position. Borders was gone. Barnes & Noble was sputtering. So that acquisition was a bit of a surprise, but I think it was sort of understood as a logical, if you know, not necessarily good and somewhat alarming, restructuring the book business. Now, as for Penguin Random House's reputation after that merger, Penguin Random House is an excellent publisher. You know, their CEO and their leadership is excellent. You know, Marcus Dole is an excellent leader who truly, really does deeply understand books and is committed. To books and not just at his own company, but he's really committed to a vibrant book business. I don't think Penguin Random House is unfairly exerting its power, but it's unquestionably exerting its power, right? And questions about whether that power that Penguin Random House wields in the market is fair, I think those are fair questions, pressing questions even, especially with Simon and Schuster now on, on Penguin Random House's Penguin Random House's plate. You know, those those questions are being addressed by regulators now, which I think is is what needs to happen. But if I'm being honest, I still question to where this all goes in the end, right? As, a, as someone who reports on the industry and is hearing from people inside and out, you know, in announcing the lawsuit, you know, A.G. Garland said that if the world's largest book publisher is permitted to acquire one of its biggest rivals, it will have unprecedented control over this important industry. But where was that statement a decade ago, right? Because because many in the industry, and Mary talked about it, believe that the damage, and Chris talked about it too, believe the damage has been done. So you know, I do think it's positive that DOJ is now paying attention to this latest last piece of consolidation, this huge move. But you know, those who you know, I have to really question the net effect of what blocking this move will do after you know inaction for all these years. Well, well Andrew Almanis with PW. Before we go to questions to, from the from the audience here, I, I have to ask about the the elephant in the room, which is. Isn't the book world more concerned about Amazon and its market dominance and book selling than they are about any dominance of a particular publisher? Absolutely, it is, and you know, and it should be. But you know, here's my feeling on that too. If we're waiting for government to step in and do something about it, we may be waiting for a while because this is not an easy nut to crack. You know, if you think that this case, the Penguin Random House Simon Schuster case, has potential to get a little messy, breaking down Amazon. Is going to be a bloodbath, right? No, no, for one, I'm just imagining that Amazon, when its turn comes, is going to argue that, hey, we actually are the one force that keeps consumer prices low, right? We're the ones that are protecting consumers from this cartel of major publishers. And publishers complain about Amazon's hardball tactics. There was a, an eye-opening government report about those tactics. But Amazon's going to say, hey, look, the publishers all negotiated their deals with us, and they all cashed the checks, and they took the growth and paid the bonuses. And, you know, Amazon is going to be also going to be able to argue that it is where it is because they're innovative, right? And the publishing industry has sort of allowed Amazon the upper hand there by, 
in many ways, effectively outsourcing innovation in the book business to this company. Some would call it disruption. Amazon is going to call it innovation. So absolutely, Amazon's dominance and size and the way they are structured and the way they operate as a data-driven operation, a, a data reseller, is an absolutely huge concern that has to be addressed at some point. My concern is that if we're just sitting back and waiting for government to get that job done, we could be waiting a while. All right, Landra well, Albanese with PW, thank you very much. And it is time now to take questions uh, from our audience. And as you uh, do use the chat function there to uh, let us know what's on your mind, if you have a question for a particular panelist, uh, for Mary Rosenberger with the Authors Guild, for Chris Sagers, Professor of Law, Antitrust Law at Cleveland State University, and for Andrew Albany's PW, let us know who, the, who we should address the question to. Um, we do have a question from, from Vincent asking about the prospect for alternative business models. And Andrew was just talking about innovation in this space. We have seen a lot of innovation in publishing. It has changed a great deal, Mary Rosenberg, since 1978, when, when uh, the Authors Guild was first uh, ringing the alarm around all of this. Is that a possible solution? Alternative business models, different ways of doing things or are, are advances really so critical as, as you've spoken about, Mary, as Andrew has talked about. Um, do, do we see alternatives, uh, you know, possibly helping authors? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'd love to respond to that. So, you know, this, I love the question because it's something that I personally spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, we don't have a perfect publishing model for authors right now. Um, nothing that gives authors an, enough of a share of, of the um, price of a book. And I, I just wanna um, reiterate what, what Andrew said. I think it's really important to think of the place that Amazon has in the total market, but also the, um, you know, the, the new developments that it's brought the, it's actually brought new new publishing models into the industry. And I think we're all grateful for that. And I'm referring mainly to um, self-publishing or independent publishing, which works really well for certain books um, and particularly for people who are willing to do all that extra work. It's a lot of extra work or find people to do it for them. I mean, it's re really running, running your own business to publish your own book. Um, it doesn't work though right now for the books that require advances. And I saw in the chat, um, a number of people said, yeah, they're, you know, books, a serious biography takes three, at least three years to write, you know, 10, you know, it takes a long time to research and write a really good book. And you need the whole idea of an advance initially was that it was paid in advance and the author could live on it and use it for research. I mean, now one of our issues at the Authors Guild is that so much of the, the advance is paid on, you know, way too late for that. But you still do need those advances as, as Andrew also said. Um, so, you know, I don't know about the idea of the government coming into this. Um, you know, we are out there fighting for more government subsidy all the time for authors. Maybe there's something about, you know, cooperative publishing where people could put money in that would go to authors for as advances. But, you know, the traditional publishing has um, been established the way that it has because, you know, the publishers invest in the author, right? They do an upfront investment. And um, because they think that they'll, they're making a bet that they'll earn income, they'll earn profit on the back end, and they'll share some of that with the author. So um, yeah, we need we need more more models, and I don't know what what they are, but I think let's all put our heads together and <laughs> try to come up with them. Right, and, and we've been talking uh, today about the antitrust case that the Department of Justice has brought to block the proposed uh, acquisition of Simon Schuster uh, uh, by Penguin Random House. We talked about its impact on on um, the publishing industry as a, as a whole. We've talked about its impact on authors, agents we've brought up. We haven't <coughs> mentioned editors and we do have a question here about that, whether there is a possible impact for authors, I'm uh, sorry, excuse me, for editors and other workers within the industry. And, and Andrew Albany, so I wanna ask you whether, again, in your conversations with people and you were an editor yourself for a publishing house, do they watch consolidation and see concerns for their job security? Oh, absolutely. 
you know, there's, first of all, there, there's the, you know, the, the duplication of jobs, right? There's, you're going to see a loss of jobs whenever you put two companies together like this. Um, yeah, abso absolutely. I, I think that this is a remarkable concern. Like it's one of the, the key concerns here is what's going to happen to the workforce. Some, some, now th there are smaller publishers that editors can, can leave and go to. But when I mentioned before, when I was an editorial assistant and there were dozens of imprints, dozens of houses, excuse me, that you could shop your book to, that was also true for editors, right? People had upward mobility in the industry because they were constantly being wooed to and leaving and going to other houses. And that's how you made your career, right? You would go to a different house and you would bring your authors with you in many cases. You know, I think today that doesn't exist quite as much. I think it's harder for young people in publishing who are in editorial assistant uh, positions to rise up the ranks because there are just fewer jobs and the organizations in front of them. And if we get down to a, a big four or a big three, that's going to be even more pronounced. So it's, it's a huge concern. And we were talking just a moment ago with Mary Rosenberger about different business models, different players trying to get involved and do things that kind of fill in the gaps in the marketplace. And we do have a comment here about university presses. Uh, uh, they've had no easy time over the last few years, obviously. Uh, the monograph is, is under threat and uh, we have um, consolidation in that area as well. I just saw the University of Georgia, I think, just purchased a, a, a New South, which is probably an interesting move, maybe a positive one in that it's, it's seeing itself much more as a, uh, as a player in the marketplace. So does anyone have any views, I'm not sure who to address this to, about university presses and where they play in all this? I'm sure they're publishers of a great many biographies, important uh, biographies. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm the right person to take that question. I can tell you as a person who has published with the university press uh, that they don't compete very hard in the royalty game. I mean, in the advances game, which is to say they don't they don't pay any, at least to people like me. So I, I have a feeling this is a fairly different, uh, such a different kettle of fish that, um, you know, in, in a perfect world, I'd like to say this is an opportunity for them. Consolidation should be a chance for them to pick some pick off some low hanging fruit. Uh, but I, I think they're probably playing a pretty different game. Right. And, and, I would and, agree with that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, Please. I would completely agree with that. Yeah, the, we, we you know, take issue with a lot of the terms in the university contracts because they don't pay advances. They try to take copyright ownership, but it is, it's a really hard market because they're, it's, it's a small, they're small markets, right? Um, but they, they publish a lot of important books as well. And We've seen a, a drive towards consolidation in, in that market as well, but they're very different markets. Yeah, they're and, very. As a former university press publisher myself, um, it's it's an incredibly important market for serious nonfiction. And the problem is, is that they're just not well supported by their parent institutions, and they're expected to compete in the same bruising market with other with trade books. It's just it's. They're in a very difficult situation. But the one thing I do see in university press publishing is there's a lot of room for innovation, right? Whether it's open access. The mission of a university press is to disseminate knowledge, right? It's not necessarily about, you know, these are, if you're publishing with the university press, it's because you are publishing for reputation. You want to get that promotion. Um, you want to be cited. You want to, you, so I think that there's more room for more innovation in university press publishing but they have to be better supported by their parent institutions. I think some of the things that come out of the university press world can have a positive effect on the trade publishing world, but without proper support, it's just not going to happen. I, I can, and, 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 sorry, I'm sorry. Ahead, I, if I, if I could, I just like to follow on that. Um, it, I think they're pretty hungry. Uh, uh, university presses are pretty hungry to take a bite of trade publishing if they could. Uh, and again, I say that as a person who wanted to write, uh, you know, brainy, very long, multiply footnoted um, academic books and was pressured quite a lot uh, by a very prominent university publisher to make my book much more like a trade book. Uh, so they want to do it. Unfortunately, I don't think they're especially good at it. Um, at least they aren't yet. Like they kind of haven't figured out what kind of books they can publish that people actually want to buy. Uh, for what it's worth, I think they would love to do it, uh, mainly because I think they, they see a volume in trade publishing uh, at lower prices, you know, than they, they traditionally charge. Um, they see some potential there that could be very valuable to them, but uh, they need to up their game a, a little bit, I think, if they're going to do it effectively. 
Well, I want to turn to a point that Susan's made that was on my mind and she, she beat me to it. I wanted to bring it up, which is about the concern for diversity in this industry um, and what the impact of all the consolidation is having on efforts to, 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 to be a more inclusive uh, industry, an industry that, 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 that looks at diversity in, in, in a much more proactive way. And um, Mary Rosenberger, perhaps you've got some thoughts on that. Um, you yeah, are I'm concerned th about literary quality, but and literary quality is about diversity as much as it's about uh, the, the writing itself, isn't it? That's correct. So when we first went to DOJ about when the merger was announced, we had two concerns. One was authors' advances, but the other was diversity of what gets published. And um, aside from the fact that it could push down author advances, authors earn less money, many authors are so close to not being able to write as a profession that it doesn't take much for them to have to take on other work and, and stop writing um, full time or write less or not at all, right? So that's one issue. So it just, it kicks out particularly among the Midwest and the more diverse type of authors it kicks them out of the whole ball game. But then there's also the issue that every publisher has its own personality, right? Every imprint does too, but it, it, it goes up to the publisher level. And when you lose an entire publisher, you lose the editorial perspective and different editorial perspective. So you lose diversity and sort of the broadest sense of the word. And I think about like Simon and Schuster, during the Trump administration, they published a lot of controversial books, a lot of books where they knew that Trump would sue them for um, defamation or whatever over them. And they went ahead and published them anyway. Would another publisher take that risk? Would PRH allow them to take that risk? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, so there's that issue about who's making the, the ultimate decisions about what gets published, fewer people at the top. And then Last, you know, I think consolidation, and this is a point we haven't talked a lot about yet, but it, it makes the editors, the acquisition editors, they have to be more bottom line focused. So they're less willing to take risks on emerging mid-list authors, you know, or voices from marginalized communities, voices with smaller potential markets. Um, you know, less willing to take on controversial ideas or literary writers who challenge, you know, the status quo or those who push the limits of, you know, of literature and, and you know, uh, that the, the, the types of books that really make us think, right? Um, and I would include, you know, sort of the, the books that are, you know, verging more towards academic type books. Those are less likely to get published because, there, there's with consolidation and what, you know, with the type of the, the kind of pressure that Amazon has put on the whole industry. Here we are at a time when we acknowledge as a society, we need diversity in general in our society and particularly in the publishing industry. And the big publishers have to focus more with more consolidation. You have to spend more time publishing books that are guaranteed bestsellers. I mean, why do you think we have so many celebrity books today? Right. I'll well, leave well, you with I, that. I, yeah, <laughs> and thank you, Mary Rosenberger. I, I, I wanna give the last word because we're running to the end of our time to Christopher Sagers. Uh, you're our antitrust guru here. We're talking really about an antitrust case. So I, I, I think the point here is that the focus on publishing and antitrust as it relates to publishing may be missing the bigger picture, that antitrust is an issue that um, perhaps uh, needs more attention across the entire economy. Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, that's the, my career has been saying that out loud. Um, and again, the most interesting thing I ever studied in doing this for 25 years was the publishing industry. And um, I learned a lesson, I think, I taught myself what I think is a lesson from studying it, which was antitrust, you know, hasn't been effective in publishing. Um, and its biggest challenge um, has, you know, it hasn't been a problem of uh, the law not being written correctly, or you know, some some underlying theoretical aspect of the law being uh, uh, needing a, a tweak or something like that. 
The problem has been that the law is hard to enforce. It's very hard for the government to bring these cases um, because it's very hard for the government to tell a story that uh, about why a particular defendant ought to lose that captures enough of the public's uh, support to really bring the cases. <clears throat> and, you know, this case, this, this particular merger case will just be another in a very long series of cases proving that. Uh, it's easy for a defendant, even as big as these defendants, <clears throat> and even as implausible as their arguments seem to me humbly, uh, it's easy for them to tell a story that will be pretty persuasive to much of the public. Uh, that in fact, uh, you know, the argument will be either that books are special and so we have to, you know, we have to consolidate our forces or uh, book publishing happens to be unusually risky because it's very hard to predict whether, whether a particular book will make money or whatever. Uh, the big lesson to me in writing the book, and I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit, so let me wrap it up. The big lesson to me in writing the book was there's never been a defendant in the 140 years, uh, 130 years we've had an antitrust law that didn't think its market was special. They all do. Um, turns out, in my humble opinion, I, uh, and let me just say, I love books as, as much as anyone. I write them occasionally. I read a lot of them. They're dear to me. Uh, but they aren't actually that special in commercial terms. Uh, and for all the values that we care about, including the democratic values that have been discussed here a little bit, uh, the problem of authors earning a living, quality, variety, et cetera, um, we would all be better served in all of those respects if the market were more competitive. That's, that's my humble view. Uh, but it's not, and uh, we're not probably going to have a competitive market in publishing because that ship sailed a long time ago, and it's because our, our antitrust law is just too hard to enforce. All right. Uh, Christopher Sager is professor of law at Cleveland State University. Thank you very much indeed for that. And Wrapping up the program, I want to thank uh, our other participants in the conversation today. Mary Rosenberger, CEO of the Authors Guild and the Authors Guild Foundation. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And Andrew Albanese, senior writer, publishes weekly and my regular guest every Friday on CCC's Velocity of Content podcast. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you, Chris. Also appreciate the participation and the support of the organizers of the Bio 22 a 2022 conference, including Kai Bird, Michael Gately, and Ann Heller. And thanks to all of the biographers, editors, agents, publishers, and publicity professionals attending this conference for joining us on this important discussion. I hope you've enjoyed our program, Bertelsmann and the Future of Publishing. I'm Christopher Keneally. Goodbye for now.